Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. He was the de facto leader of Iraq for more than a year. Paul Bremer oversaw America's occupation after the US-led invasion in 2003. It was the most powerful foreign post held by an American since World War II. Before Iraq, Bremer had no experience of working in the Middle East. Despite this, he had to manage Iraq's transition from dictatorship to democracy. But Bremer will be remembered for a series of controversial decisions. He dissolved the Iraqi army and banned members of Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party from government jobs. This left tens of thousands of people unemployed. Groups like Al-Qaeda in Iraq exploited the growing anger against the Americans. Soon there was chaos with almost daily attacks and brutal violence. Many analysts agree that it was such chaos that encouraged the rise of Daesh. 18 years later, does Paul Bremer have any regrets? Paul Bremer, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, it's nice to be with you. Following the 2003 invasion, you were tapped by President George W. Bush to head the so-called Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq. Now, you were undoubtedly a very prominent and experienced U.S. diplomat at that time, but to be fair, you had quite limited experience when it comes and came to Middle Eastern politics. What made you say yes to the assignment anyway? What was the attraction for you? Well, you know, my father served in the Navy during the Second World War, and he lectured us kids. I was the oldest of five every night around the kitchen table about the importance of public service. And so when I finished school, I decided that I would go into public service, which I did as a professional diplomat for some 25 years. And when I was asked by the president of the United States to return to service, an area of the world that I didn't know well, I had lived in Afghanistan, but that's obviously not the same as Iraq. But when the president of the United States asks an American to take a job, I believe the American must have very good reasons to say no. And I felt honored by the request, so I agreed to take the position. And the position certainly made you overnight the most important and powerful U.S. civilian uh, in Iraq. Now, of course, the 18th anniversary of the U.S.-led invasion will surely rekindle the debates about whether it was a success or failure. I know where you stand. Uh, you once said, and I quote, if ever a three-week war ever brought about such enormous benefits to 25 million people, this was the war. The Iraqi people are infinitely better off today than they were under Saddam Hussein, end of quote. 18 years later, do you still stand by this statement? Absolutely. Uh, Iraq, of course, has descended in much chaos uh, since the days when I was there. I was only there uh, for 14 months in 2003 and 2004. And I was charged with doing two things, getting the Iraqi economy back to working and providing the Iraqis with a political plan to be able to choose their own government. And they both of those things happened. The economy grew 41% according to the IMF in 2004. Unemployment dropped from 50% to 10%. Oil production was above record levels, and electricity was 50% more than when Saddam was there. But the most important thing was the Iraqis were able to create a constitutional process for choosing their own government, which they now do. And They've had five changes of government since then, all of them brought about by open democratic elections. There is no other country in the Arab world that has such a good record. So they are, in terms of the economic basis and in terms of the political basis, they are much better off than they were under Saddam Hussein. How would you then respond to critics who say, the war primarily created sectarian violence between Sunnis and Shiites and uh, led to the rise of Shiite 
militias, Al-Qaeda, and eventually ISIS. Is that a criticism that you can understand? Well, I can understand that it is true that politics became much more sectarian basis, Arab versus Kurd, Sunni versus Shia, and so forth. Uh, that was brought about by the Iraqis. They insisted, not surprisingly, after the liberation, in having some degree of assurance that they would each have some role in the government, whether they were Sunnis or Shia, Kurds or Arabs. It was inevitable that something like that would happen. It has been a serious problem, as you suggest, uh, under those governments, and it is today still, that Islamic extremists, Al-Qaeda, Ansar al-Islam, and then, of course, Daesh, have all tried to upset this new order. And so far, they haven't succeeded. But it has been a very rough 18 years. Upon the appointment of President George W. Bush, uh, you found yourself in a position of, in essence, being the head of state of 25 million Iraqis overnight. And critics are saying that your decision to ban all members of Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party from government jobs and disband the Iraqi army, in essence, created hundreds of thousands of armed, angry, and unemployed Sunnis, many of whom went on to insurgency. In hindsight, do you have any regrets about these decisions? None whatsoever. Uh, first, it's not true that we uh, kicked all the Ba'athists out of the government. That's simply not the case. We made it clear that the two top positions in every ministry, would, people would not be able to serve in those two top ministries if they were Ba'athists. The number of Ba'ath Party members who actually were affected by the de-Ba'athification ba was much smaller. I did make a serious mistake here. I turned the implementation of what was designed as a moderate and very narrow uh, uh, command about Ba'athism. I turned it over to the Iraqi politicians to implement for themselves. And that was a mistake. I should have turned it over to some kind of a legal court to deal with debathification. Now, on the question of the army, the disbanding of the army was, in fact, the problem was I used the wrong verb. I said, we're going to disband the army. There was no army. There was not a single unit of the Iraqi Saddam's army standing to arms anywhere in the country, even before I got there, as of the middle of April in 2003. So we had a choice. We could either recall the army or we could build a new army. And the idea of recalling the army set off huge uh, opposition in Iraq from not just the Kurds who were worried about Saddam's army since Saddam's army had fought them in the 1980s, but also from Shia and Sunnis who were concerned that if we called back Saddam's army, they would have Saddamism without Saddam. I don't, you know, you said many people, many people from the military joined the insurgency. I've never seen any figures that point that out, but I don't doubt that some of them did join the insurgency. But if they did so, it was not because they couldn't be used by the government. There was, a, the economy grew 41% that year. There were plenty of jobs. It's because they didn't believe in the democratic future for Iraq. They wanted to come back to power by using firearms. And so, as you say, some of them no doubt did join Ansar al-Islam or al-Qaeda or uh, more recently Daesh. But I stand by both decisions. An anniversary is always a good opportunity and occasion to look back at what went right or wrong. Looking back at uh, the Iraqi war and 18 years after, what are the main lessons for the United States? Uh, what are the main lessons that the U.S. has learned from the operation and war in Iraq? Well, I suppose it depends on who you ask about the, who learned the lesson. The lesson that I take from it is we should only undertake operations like uh, the invasion of Iraq if the political leadership in this country and the American people support a long-term engagement. 
And the problem has been that under successive presidents, uh, Obama and then Trump, it has not been clear that the American government would be willing to stay. In fact, the biggest single mistake since 2003 was Obama's decision to withdraw the American forces at the end of 2011. That led immediately to Daesh taking over a third of the country, including the major city of Mosul. And of course, Obama had to, in effect, admit he was wrong by sending the troops back. So a clear, consistent, regular American involvement in an operation like this, well-resourced, both on the civilian side and on the military side, that's the key lesson. Have you been following events in Iraq? And if so, what do you make of the country's current state? Well, the present government faces the same problem that grew very significantly under uh, Prime Minister al-Maliki. And that problem is the fact that the government is, does not control the legitimate use of force. There are hundreds of thousands of mostly Iranian-backed militia men who are outside the central command structure. And they are, of course, conducting attacks. We've seen them in, in Erbil, we've seen them in Baghdad, we see them in the provinces. And this government, like the governments before, have not been able to bring these forces under central Iraqi government control. Uh, it is obviously uh, an element also of American policy towards Iran right now, where the current administration, the Biden administration, is seeking a way to return to a negotiating table with the Iranians. But one of the matters that has to be discussed with the Iranians is the Iranian interference in regional affairs, including in Iraq. Now, of course, there have been several elections in Iraq since uh, 2004, but I think it's safe to say, and you've already alluded to it, that the overall situation has improved. Little corruption and violence, unfortunately, continue to plague the country. What would be your advice to current Iraqi leaders on how to tackle these problems? Well, it's pretty much the same problem that's been there uh, for the last 10 years or so since we pulled our troops out in uh, 2011. And that is the need for the central government to have a broad enough political base and enough authority and then the decisiveness to try to integrate these Iraqis who are effectively working as Iranian, as Iranian uh, militia, get them back either into the regular military structure of Iraq or into jobs in the private sector. You mentioned corruption. Obviously, a lot of the problems in Iraq today are taken from the, um, are, are, are based on the corruption that is rampant. Uh, it is unfortunately not unusual with a country where there's a single source of real, real wealth, and that source is oil, and it's owned by the government. And that is a structural problem that probably would take a decade to fix. And I hope some Iraqi leader will begin that process. Because to get those men who are in these militia, these unorganized or, or unauthorized militia, uh, will require substantial job growth in the private sector if they're not going to go into the central army. The U.S. presidents uh, succeeding George W. Bush all had a varying degree of interest uh, in matters in Iraq. President Trump, for instance, of course, had a policy of ending the forever wars. Uh, what advice would you give and offer President Biden moving forward? Well, in the un very unlikely event he asked me, uh, I think President Biden comes to the job with a very good grasp of the Middle East in general and uh, the foreign policy of the United States in, in Iraq. He supported the war in Iraq at, at, at the beginning. Uh, he understands he's met, I think, some, a number of the Iraqi leaders, the ones who've been around uh, for some time because he was in the Senate uh, on the head of the Foreign Relations Committee for a number of years. 
My advice would be to take away the lesson that I mentioned a minute ago, which is the need for a steadfast, steady, consistent American strategy involving political support, support to the Iraqi army through training, intelligence, special forces operations, and an effort to try to make the Iraqi economy appealing to American businesses so that the people of Iraq will have more opportunities for jobs. In the 14 months that you spent in Iraq, you were the top administrator, American administrator of uh, the country, yet you all but disappeared from public life after leaving Iraq, or it seemed anyway, there were rumors that you had become a painter or a ski instructor uh, in Vermont. Uh, why did you disappear from public life after Iraq? <laughs> well, I disappeared right away because I was so exhausted. Working 20-hour days, seven days a week for 14 months doesn't give you an awful lot of rest. No, it's true. I, I have taken up uh, oil painting. I, I do quite a lot of oil landscapes. And uh, I did. I have become a professional athlete. I'm a professional ski instructor. Not this winter uh, because of the plague, but uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to it again in November or December. And regarding those 14 months, you wrote a memoir titled My Year in Iraq, The Struggle to Build a Future of Hope. I think it's fair to say that your name will be forever linked with Iraq one way or the other. Certainly the press conference you gave upon capturing, upon the capture of Saddam Hussein. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. That statement will certainly be etched in international relations history. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about being forever linked with your statements, uh, statements in Iraq, with uh, your time in Iraq. How do you feel about that? Well, you know, I'm a historian. I studied history. I read history. Uh, I've made a little bit of history in Iraq. So I take the long view. I think uh, while the current situation in Iraq is serious and dangerous, there's no question about it, uh, history takes longer to reach judgments. and it would be brave of me to tell you where I think history will come out on, on the question of what we did in Iraq. I believe that looking at what my team and I were able to do in a short time of 14 months, we were able to accomplish the goals that were set out for us with the authority that was set out for us. There have been mistakes made since then by Americans and Iraqis and others. But I think in the long run, history will say that helping the Iraqis to set up a system where they can choose their own government was an important achievement for American strategic uh, policy. And 18 years after the invasion, your conscience, you're at ease uh, and your conscience is clear with the US-led invasion, but of course your role primarily in particular. Yes, I think we did the best we could in the time that was given to us, which was not enough time, and with the resources that were uh, put under our, during our time, both military and civilian, which was lacking in both cases, I believe we did the best we could, and that's about all you can ever say about a job. Did you do the best you could? Paul Bremer, thank you so much for taking time. Thank you so much for joining us. Nice to be with you.